Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for watching. How do you write about feelings of loneliness, being lost and awkward in a way that makes the reader laugh? And how do you get away with constructing sentences that start one place and end in another and really on the surface don't make sense? I hope that um, after watching this, that you'll get answers to those questions. Um, my name is Desiree Orbeck, and I'm a former Danish lecturer at the uh, Scandinavian Studies Department at University of Washington. Dorte Nuas, the writer for today's discussion, is heavily inspired by a Swedish writing tradition. Her literary work centers on female misfits and a search of belonging and so much more. Norris debuted in 2002, and she writes both short stories and novels. Her short stories have been featured in magazines such as the Boston Review, Harper's Magazine, and The Fence. Um, and she was also the first Danish writer to be, ever be published in The New Yorker. Today's book, Mirror, Shoulder, Signal, was nominated for the Man Booker International Prize in 2017 and for Les Anis Beaupris. Her latest work is Wild Swims Stories and is also available in English. Welcome, daughter. Thank you very much. Is there anything you would like to add to this introduction? No, I'm super excited. I didn't know that it was uh, nominated for Les Anis Beaupris. Well, that's because I, it was everything was chaos back then, <laughs> so I never noticed. Now it's uh, I'm honored to uh, to to be participating in this conversation and um, talking about literature in the U.S. is always a joy. We're very very excited to have you. Um, so I want to start out um, by asking you about something that might sound very like on the surface just sound a little strange, but I read and heard in an interview with you um, that you identified as a writer way before you were published. In fact, as a kid, you already identified as a writer, but it took quite a long time for you to get published. Um, and my question is, how did you not only keep dreaming, but hold on to that identity as a writer um, when you felt so passionately about it inside but the world did not yet know about it well i think i actually kept it hidden because i was from rural denmark i came from a small parish everyone was farmers i mean i didn't talk about having this writer identity in me and having that kind of spirit going for myself um and also, I think when this comes uh, with identity, it's even more dangerous to pursue it because if being a writer is who you are, um, then imagine the horror if you can't get published. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because that means that you can't really become who you are. So um, I was uh, blessed with... Uh, Danish teachers, equivalent to the English teachers in, in your school, uh, who saw that I had a kind of talent and also saw that I easily got a little bored in, in the classes and therefore gave me other uh, things to read and study. And, um, and one of them, when I was 16 or 17, said that uh, I was good at writing, but I needed some education because I didn't come from a home with books. Mm -hmm. um, so she suggested that I studied literature at university, which I did. But, and I studied that for nine years. And I, I must say, I, I learned a lot from reading. I mean, writing comes from reading, 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 reading. Uh, I had a lot of trouble with theory. Um, the theory scared me a little bit because it was so structured and almost suffocating at times and, and, um, and, and wasn't, it wasn't really good at, at hearing the music of literature. It was like we were trying to pin down what literature meant instead of listening to what it said. So I drifted from 
the literary studies to art history where I was more freed. And I think that was a blessing to me. Mm -hmm. So when I um, wrote my thesis, I, um, the day I handed my thesis in, which was on a Swedish writer, um, I ran home and I wrote my first novel and it was like jumping from a cliff and just hoping that there was water because this was my identity. Because imagine if there was no water and it was just splash <laughs> uh, against the concrete. Um, so I would say that uh, another Danish writer who has had the same, uh, somewhat the same story about identity and writing is uh, the writer Ida Jessen, mm -hmm. who said that she was eight, she walked into the kitchen, said to her mom, mom, I'm a, I'm a writer, I want to be a writer, and left the kitchen again. And, and I mean, and I mean it, it's quite a path to set out on, because you have to learn how to write before you become a writer. So I was, I mean, the minute I wrote my first novel, I sent it in and that novel was accepted by the publishing house that I wanted uh, it to be accepted by. So um, the minute I actually decided to do it, yeah. I did it. <laughs> but well, it, was scary. Yeah. it was scary. <laughs> I love that image also of the kitchen because uh, if a woman were wants to write um she should get out of the kitchen and start writing right <laughs> exactly yeah or write in the kitchen i don't care <laughs> yeah um that is that is absolutely amazing and very encouraging um so um if we turn to your book uh mirror shoulder signal which is this one um mm -hmm. for those who may not have read it yet which i highly strongly absolutely um uh, encourage them to do because it's an amazing piece of work. Um, would you set the scene and, and just tell a little bit about um, what it's about and what your inspiration for this book was? Uh, I started writing it in 2013. So it's almost 10 years ago that I started writing it. Yeah. And uh, I was, uh, I lived in Copenhagen back then. Uh, I don't anymore, but I did back then. And um, I, uh, it's always hard to start uh, out on a novel. It's, I mean, I find it incredibly difficult to start a novel because you have to accumulate so much energy and you know you have to work with it for years. Um, so I thought you just have to start somewhere. And I knew that I wanted to start uh, somewhere uh, where there was existential material enough for a book to get written. And I had just gotten my driver's license and I had also just bought myself a car. And what I had also just done was that I had um, uh, decided to move out of Copenhagen, but didn't know where to go. So that was the, my point of departure when I wrote it. And I can, and it's obvious that some of these themes spills into the book. We have a middle-aged woman, she's in Copenhagen. She's trying to get her driver's license, but has great complications uh, getting it. She's, um, She's lost in urbanism. She's lost in uh, the way society wants women to be. Mm -hmm. She's uh, lost in what <clears throat> we for decades and decades in the Western world have been taught, namely that uh, an urban life is a life with status mm -hmm. and that the opposite is uh, bad. And so she's at that crossroad in her life where she needs to uh, learn to drive that car because if she doesn't learn that she can't go where she wants to go yeah. she can't live where she wants to live she can't be who she wants to be um, so you could say it's a bit it's a classical motif the woman in the car but uh, there's a reason why that is a classic motif because it's about becoming the captain of your own ship uh, you know, becoming in control of your own being and having the right to choose your own course and not being the co-driver uh, of other people's uh, needs anymore. So that's what yeah. it's about. Yeah, among, it's, other <laughs> among other things, you're touching on so many interesting things here because um, like the way I read it at least, she's not yet, yet ready. Like she's holding in so many things because I mean, change is hard, even though we're told that it's it's good. 
Um, and she, the, the whole PT thing, the physical therapist, um, like she's holding so many things inside amongst those anger and shame that she, she gets sick, not just from her own anger, but also um, from other people, taking other people's anger in and turning it inward, right? Mm -hmm. um, so can you, can you talk a little bit about like when she actually stands up for herself and tells people no, or I don't want to do it your way, whether it's in the uh, in a masculine context or in a more like structural societal context, then things change. Not when she's just like internalizing her anger and turning it to her like inwards. Mm -hmm. When she when she stands up and says something, that's when she's ready to take the next mm -hmm. level or step. Is that do you was that what your that's intention because... was? Yeah, but that's because uh, the whole motif with the learning to drive is very existential because when you're sitting behind uh, the wheel, um, that's like you're sitting there with a weapon. You can actually kill people in a car. So you're in power. But um, if you've been taught all your life that you're not supposed to be in power because you're a woman, it's really hard to take on that um, uh, role mm -hmm. and, and perhaps also the fear of what happens when you do it and um, so uh, the minute she builds up the courage to say to her driving instructor shut the hell up <laughs> I'm I'm driving this car yeah. that's the moment where it, it works for her but before you get there and most women before they get to that point mm -hmm. there's a struggle there's a struggle against what we were taught, how society wants us to behave, um, and, and uh, what we fear will happen if we become uh, strong when we're supposed to be weak and sweet. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that uh, going on in the car and in her life as such. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also the, it, the interesting thing, and it, it's still puzzling me after all these years, uh, because uh, when it was it came out in Denmark, there was a lot of love for it, but there was so much anger against this Sonia character. It was before Me Too hit Denmark. Mm -hmm. um, it was uh, I met a lot of at readings uh, older women who were so angry with uh, the protagonist that I, I just didn't know what was going on, and they were yelling at me at readings <laughs> like. What? She should just pull herself together. She's such a bitch. She should just, and I go, what? She's, she's, she's just a nice, a bit insecure person in learning how to drive. The interesting thing uh, was that when it was published outside Denmark, she was conceived as a rebel, <laughs> right? There's a lot of culture in that. There's that, a lot of culture, in that, lot of culture yeah. in that. So, and I didn't think her, of her as neither. I didn't see her as a loser. Mm -hmm. I didn't see her as a rebel. I just saw her as a protagonist trying to find a way of being in the world where she could actually um, live like she wanted to and not like everybody else wanted her to. It should be a very uh, small ask, but- But it is. Her. Yeah, it but is. it's so interesting, like, being a woman, um, also having like gone through life, right? It's so interesting how we keep things inside. And then the minute we finally, you know, stand up tall and say enough, mm -hmm. then it's so freeing. And I, I think a lot of people, a lot of women can relate and identify to to your text in this regard. So I'm, I'm very thankful that you wrote this actually. Um, but so and I'm talking add, about, oh, sorry. I just want to add that there were also a lot of women uh, who came up to me and and men actually who came up to me and say I identify so much with her situation, mm -hmm. both mm -hmm. geographically and emotionally. Yeah. So it, so that just to paint the entire the whole picture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not it's not like the other is not the man always. <laughs> it's not it's uh, yeah. yeah, and not not everyone's aggressive. No, absolutely not. Um, so um, it's interesting, I'm, I'm gonna pivot a little bit here because I'm, I'm thinking about um, the touch in your book 
there's so much with both hands and also the touch, the physical touch, both with the um, with the PT um, when she goes to her massages, but also being aware of her own hands and being aware of the when she um, goes from a female um, person who is supposed to uh, teach her how to drive to um, a man who is clearly like uh, overstepping some boundaries uh, within this confinement of the car. Um, and then at the end, um, Martha, which I kind of reads as a future Sonia in a way. Hey, um, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's yeah, pretty that. obvious. It's true. <laughs> um but is, so you're feeding herself yes yes of course um so <laughs> how did you uh how did you think about touch and the, the different feelings a touch can invoke in a person when you were working with this text wow i never got that question before <laughs> i never even thought about it i remember i was in new york once with another writer and uh, he said, you're touching everything. He said, like when we're passing things on the street, I was touching trees. Mm -hmm. I was, um, so I, I probably do that a lot. Mm -hmm. So I, maybe I just uh, gave that uh, tactile uh, need um, to my character without knowing it. Mm -hmm. um, but also in, in the case of Ellen who gives her massages and who only, wants her to be well she, she's not evil but she's interpreting stuff uh reading her like a book but reading her wrong <laughs> and that, <laughs> that can be quite dangerous yeah. um and there's also uh the scene where they uh in order which is a me making fun of uh, certain movements in urbanism that they go to a park to experience nature and feel up the trees and hug the trees and and you know do that and pluck the moss and, and all that yeah the moss and you know and to become which is from a for a country girl like me is like um, hilarious <laughs> <laughs> you know because the nature is there and it's right outside the door so um, uh, I never thought of that but that's a good observation um, that there is something with the, the touch. Um, I was also asked a lot about uh, the relationship to the male driving instructor. And um, I think being in that small space with a big man, uh, most women will be, be very aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, he's not doing anything bad, actually. He's not harassing her. He's not. He's just being goofy. Mm -hmm. But the fear of losing control in that situation, I think, is very basic for women uh, that we can feel um, very vulnerable, mm -hmm. especially if you can't drive the vehicle and you're dependent on this big dude to handle the brakes and and shift gears and stuff it's like you're so out of control yeah. uh, not only can't you control what happens to your own body you can't control what where you go in that situation and um so some people said he was he's 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 really horny no not really but she's scared he might be lonely, but that doesn't mean he's he might be chatty and and you know goofy and stuff. But he's not um, fondling her. He's mm. he he wants conversation. He wants to connect. Yeah, uh, again, and that is um, a great segue because and he also is taking her to a landfill. I think we would call it here. Um, and and she doesn't have a sense of direction. So again, she's in an environment where she feels lost and like doesn't know how to get out of it. Um, but again, the, um, the theme about, it, it seems to me reading this that she has a hard time knowing when something is strictly personal and when something is within um, a professional setting. Mm -hmm. And when people in the professional setting are being nice and inclusive and inviting her, because to me at least she seems 
it's not on the inside only she's super insecure, like she oozes it on the outside as well. Um, how did you, how did you work with this? Like, it's so many levels because the boundaries, we are not, I'm not sure as a reader at least, whether they, she's not aware of where the boundaries are and therefore super confused or if they are actually overstepping their boundaries. How did you work with that? I, I think if, I mean, I work with it intuitively and also very musically. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes I write stuff and it looks back at me from the screen and I laugh. I go, oh, funny <laughs> um, <laughs> or interesting. It's like it, it, it emerges to me while I write. I think what she has, one of, as far as I remember, uh, I, I wanted to depict and describe what happens to people who are pleasers. Mm -hmm. Because she, she is observing all these. Uh, she knows when the boundaries are crossed. She mm -hmm. knows that, but she's scared of saying it. Mm -hmm. She's scared of, of going, stop that. You know, and maybe it doesn't matter the where the boundaries. Is. Yeah, Be and so maybe it doesn't matter where the boundaries are for the other person because it's her boundaries that are being mm -hmm. overstepped. So it's it's violating her. And then mm -hmm. again, when she finally is like, "I'm not comfortable with this. I don't have to escape and make up an excuse that I I got lost in this pseudo wood outside of Copenhagen. I can actually say no. I don't want to do exactly. this." Yeah. And that's where, where she does it, which yeah. also means that she's probably quite comfortable with him right there. She's yeah. probably not really scared of him there. Mm -hmm. That's why she, because she can tell that he just wants to connect and babble on about World War II, you know. <laughs> so, but, um, so what I do in my writing as such is that I love to enter into the heads and the thoughts of the protagonist. I do that in my short stories because that mm -hmm. allows me to enter into the mind of, very different characters and uh, sort of eavesdrop on the kind of monologues that we all have inside our heads all yeah. the time. Yeah. We can't, I mean, inside ourselves, we're alone. We are, it's, we just are. But we can connect to the surroundings through thought and caresses and connection, but we have a voiceover in our head and we live with that uh, on our own. And, but the literature, movie music art is our tool to get in there and listen to what humanity is thinking in yeah. there and um and the interesting thing you may i, I mean it's, it's not that i've thought about it much before but you made me think of it now is that um we're entering this pleaser's mind we're actually listening to a lot of the um thing she's thinking also about her at one point she meets her friend and she doesn't really like that friend mm -hmm. I mean they're having a lunch and this friend is not really a good friend well she's and not present no supposed to be present <laughs> exactly and she's uh, she's not interested in the in, in the life of others and we hear that voiceover in in Sonia's head and some people in Denmark also go oh she's so rude no, she's just thinking and having an inner monologue about what she sees, uh, what she feels. And we all have that. And if you say otherwise, you're lying. It's <laughs> we probably good we don't always say what we think. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, Facebook is bad enough as it is, or Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so there is a character that is not really a character, but I want to I want to um, move to it because it, it keeps appearing in your text, and it's very interesting because um, it's a fortune teller that Sonia met very early on in her life, mm -hmm. and the only thing Sonia remembers from this fortune teller is something that is quite mundane, like everyone encounters. A relationship that's not great and and suffers from emotions over that and then she spent so much time trying to remember what this fortune teller said instead of just shrugging it off and you know walking stepping into life um so again she's held back just like the city is holding her back or other things are holding her back how did you um 
what was your thinking of like dripping this and then by the end of the book we don't hear about the fortune teller anymore and she's like mentally moving on it seems like it's at least that's how I read it how mm -hmm. um I write about time structures in all my books I mean my short story collection map of uh, uh um wild swims it's called in English mm -hmm. um even starts with the sentence it's a question of time so and I'm always very preoccupied with how time um builds our personality, which also means how does memory, how is the work for us? How do we have access to where we came from? And also how do we see our future? So um, because the way time works on us says a lot about who we are and the predicament that we're in. For instance, if a person is very, very sad or in grief, the problem is that they can't see a future. They don't want to go forward mm -hmm. because they don't want to go forward without the, the one that they lost or the thing that they lost. And also people who are very afraid of the future have a tendency to turn their back towards the future and look only backwards. And that's, we see that a lot in politics right now and populism, mm -hmm. uh, let's stop time. We also sometimes see it in, in um, in, in people who want to, see, which is quite interesting. I have to write about that one time, about people who want to stop time. I mean, like psychologically stop time. Mm -hmm. You see that in some elderly men, <laughs> you know, who don't want to let go of power, for instance. Well, that would be convenient, wouldn't it? Exactly. So, <laughs> uh, so all this just to say that the fortune teller fits into my uh, interest in that. Mm -hmm. Because um, what happens to a psychology that cannot, that feels like her, her uh, future has been described and is therefore her past. Yeah. Yeah. That is um, very interesting. <laughs> right. So, so um, I, I, that stuff like that triggers me and, um, and and I found it really, there's a reason why um, I've heard that in La Divina Commedia by Dante, uh, what is it, the, the, the Divine Comedy? Yeah. Isn't that I, yeah. I, I, just um, familiar. I don't know how, what it's I think the Divine Comedy. Um, okay. um, I, there is a story about, about how uh, uh, fortune tellers are also, they have a special place in the ninth circle of hell right next to the bishops <laughs> yeah and the, and I always wonder why why are there uh, fortune tellers uh, down there and it's because I think it's because they mess with the structure of time yeah and that's, uh, that's a devilish thing to do they also put you in a prison sort of they do it's a devilish thing to do yeah. and it's very manipulative yeah um, because uh, if you if you hit on somebody who's very vulnerable and and scared, and this uh, and and sort of dislocated, mm -hmm. um, you know they hang on to that, and a lot of people do it. I mean, I I sometimes eavesdrop on people in buses and stuff and talk. Oh, I I I bring my clairvoyant, and I just go, oh, don't, just don't do it, <laughs> please don't do it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I haven't, I've never gone to one, so I, what, what am I to know? But I, for me, I think it would be, yeah, like a prison, like now it's predicted and now I have to some some way conform yeah. to this. So yeah. I think it's a good thing she can't remember. She she can actually decide her own destiny once she has built up enough courage. And also she didn't choose, she didn't choose it. She did. She doesn't believe in fortune yeah. tell. She's just been drinking beer with one. Yeah. We just went it on, you know, so it's like, yeah. She's just leaning against the fridge and here someone comes in uh, telling exactly. her things she doesn't necessarily want to know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I like to play with, with time structures. Um, yeah. It's the way I, um, it's one of the ways I pull myself into the writing and it's, um, it, it's, it's never, I've never stopped being curious about that. Well, please don't because I love reading about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, I want to talk about, um, the feeling of being prey 
which is a feeling I got um, from reading this, like a prey uh, in as a student in a in a car you can't escape from. And here I'm not talking about the the male um, instructor, but more you do the female uh, instructor who is like talking on her or like she's super aggressive also very aggressive like throwing up on her with her words right um and, and taking her hostage and and just assuming a certain position without asking her and in a public sphere and a personal sphere and being a hostile prey in the city almost because you it's a matter of the in for Sonia at least she doesn't thrive in the city. She needs to get away to survive, and if she doesn't get away, she will co- become prey of the city or the structure. I don't know. I, I haven't thought it through, but I just got this feeling of her being prey in so many different um, areas. Do you see what I mean, or is that something you've thought about? Yeah, but uh, um, I never thought of the word prey in itself. Um, I think she's uh, trying to get some kind of control and being able to maneuver on her mm-hmm. own. And I think it goes for everyone who doesn't know how to do that. They will be vulnerable and 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 um, um, pray. I mean, they will yeah. be easy to move in on. They will be yeah. easy to confuse. They'll be yeah. easy to destabilize. Yeah. And, um, and, and I'm not even sure it goes for, for her as a woman as such, but at, at that existential situation she's in. Um, because if you don't know where you want to go and who you are, and if you have the power to do it, mm-hmm. and what will happen to your life if you do it, um then it's easy for people to manipulate you or yeah. uh, and relationships become difficult because um you're not in charge yeah yeah they and, don't necessarily even take advantage of her they just put her in a box she doesn't fit into and she doesn't no. feel comfortable in right and she doesn't protest yeah she doesn't right. To begin yeah. with, she protests, protests inside her head, yeah. you know, yeah. and she's trying to get in control of it. Um, so, and and to me, writing this was also, um, I mean, I'm from a generation in Denmark where uh, we were, we grew up in, in rural Denmark. We were all told that we had to leave because uh, there were no prospects for us mm-hmm. in the countryside, mm-hmm. and. Um, and this is also what a lot of people came up to me and talked to me uh, after the book in Copenhagen and Oz and also in big cities in Europe. Um, they said, I, didn't ne- I never wanted to leave, but I had to. And I'm constantly divided between the place I came from and that I had to leave. So it's also um, a wound that is in Sonia. Mm-hmm. that isn't really described in Danish literature right now mm-hmm. that um, that perhaps not all people are meant to live in big cities perhaps um, there should be a life uh, a good life to live other places mm-hmm. um, and uh, but um, as a person myself who left Copenhagen um and I left Copenhagen in the middle of an international literary breakthrough. So it was so incredibly noisy. That was what drove me out of the city. I wanted, I wanted to go back, back to a place where I belonged and where I knew all the codes uh-huh. and where there was silence and there was uh, a life that I understood uh, to the core. Yeah. Um, but I also had that discussion. I, of course, I donated that discussion to, um, to Sonia. Um, what will happen when I do that? And there was conflict when I did it. There was. Uh, I want to go. I want to get back to this because um, I think a lot of the viewers can relate to that. Many have um, immigrated to the United States or other places in the world. Um, but first, I, I made a promise uh, in the beginning in the intro that we would talk about your sentences. Um, and uh, I just want to say, chapter sixteen. For those who are reading, will be reading this book. I 
like I think my neighbors thought I was going crazy because I was laughing so hard. <laughs> um, so that is a very funny chapter. Um, but you have many, many places where you start one place in a sentence and then it changes like a sentence about sorrow. Um, and then it ends with there is nothing in the fridge or um, she won't <laughs> set the it? Yeah, remember that? Uh, or she won't send the letter, but, and she hopes Yuda is out driving with someone else. Or um, uh, some, mm -hmm. she doesn't want to say anything about music that she knows a lot about. Uh, and there are so many lanes on the, on the freeway, like in one <laughs> sentence. Yeah. And it's just, at first glimpse, it doesn't make sense. And then it's like, that is adding a level to what you really want to say that is just, I think, outstanding. Um, how do you do it? Like, maybe both on a um, level of thinking about it, but also tangibly doing it within a sentence. How do you come up with this? It comes naturally, because I think it sounds great. <laughs> I it think really it does. It works. I love that's it. That's one thing. It works. The other yeah. thing is, I do think that uh, that's how our mind works. I mean, you're doing the dishes in your kitchen. As, I mean, you're... And you're thinking about death. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, or you're picking up your kid from school and contemplating how high Mount Everest is. I mean, that's that's how the your your mind works. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing is that it's 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 a technique that I think comes from um, the short story, mm -hmm. because in short stories you have to transport. Uh, the narrative very quickly. That's what short story writers are good at is because you don't have have 700 pages to describe um, everything. So uh, when you and an opening of a short story should be very, very to the point and precise. And that's what this kind of sentences uh, can do. It, they can transport the narrative forward. Um, I'm doing a, a, a book club, another book club uh, about Tove Ditlifsen, yeah. uh, starting tomorrow in New York. And uh, I noticed that she does the same. I, it was like an epiphany that she can also, not in the exact same way as you described, but she's able to transport the narrative very quickly like that, like taking the situation from this place to that place in one sentence. Yeah, even emotionally, or yes, I mean, or I, I always, I think it's a, it's a great thing to be able to, I used to say, to, to build a character, and character, and burn down a village in one sentence. That's yeah. your job as a writer. Well, good I luck. Think you, yeah, I think, <laughs> I think you succeed, and it's just, it's, um, it's such a pleasure to read. Um, I, I, I love it. I love the way of. Um, it, it has this uh, underplayed Nordic, but still to me at least very universal feel. And it's just, it's just amazing. It's so great. Please read Thank it, reader, uh, those who are watching this. Okay, so back to, back to um, moving away from, from a place and not feeling you belong, and then maybe moving back to where you came from and then that place has changed. Um, because we're told that change is positive, uh, positive and uh, where the real life is and the cultural life is and, and the exciting people are, are in the urban areas, right? Um, and you also say in your book um, that she hopes for her reality to turn into a fairy tale. And then, you know, the next paragraph starts with, or a nightmare. <laughs> we don't yeah. know. <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and so, um, and, and also we, I get this feeling that she's addicted to the small dramas of life and that adds on to her maybe putting herself in awkward uh, situations where she doesn't feel she belongs. It's, maybe it sounds a little messy now, but, um, but how did you think about arriving and not belonging and no longer um, being able to 100% relate to the place that you originally came from? I think it's a, a human condition. Um, and I think most people uh, will have to go through that on, on some level, but people who change countries or 
uh, move a long way or have to or refugees or for any other reasons will of course have that um, feeling even stronger than most. <clears throat> I mean, the, the sentence, uh, you cannot return to the place you came from, mm -hmm. uh, says it all mm -hmm. because it's in past tense. And you can, and that we're back to time as a structure mm -hmm. because you can't go backwards, right? So, um, so, but what do you do then mm -hmm. if you don't want to move on in the direction that you uh, accidentally chose when you were young? Um, and this is, I think this would, I think it would be easier to correct uh, or make a new choice in your life if uh, it wasn't so stigmatized mm -hmm. um, that you wanted to correct or choose something else for yourself. Um, and, and it's also very stigmatized to say, once you belong in two different places, like many of us, of us living in America, um, that, that adds also comes with um, embracing loneliness and feeling alienated and not having a place you belong to 100%. That's very stigmatized, but that's the reality. That is the reality. Yeah. 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 And also it's the reality that you don't share an everyday life with the family back home. And uh, so it can be hard to take the telephone. I mean, you even have the time difference, but even in Denmark, <laughs> you know, yeah. to take the, you know, to talk on the phone, which in this book is um, uh, Sonia trying to connect with her sister. Mm -hmm. uh, who has never moved and who still lives in the rural area where they came from. Yeah. And they don't know how to communicate anymore because they don't share daily lives. And also they don't share language anymore. Mm -hmm. So uh, Sonia is so desperate to connect to this sister and cuddle up with her and hug her and become, you know, and the sister doesn't know how to deal with this estranged, urbanized uh, sibling. Mm -hmm. So who has uh, left her. Um, she, was, she was saying really awkward things because she doesn't know how to reach her. <laughs> no, she doesn't know how to speak the language yeah. anymore yeah. because her, her sister lives a traditional life and she yeah. doesn't. I mean, she, she left traditionalism back uh, when she was young. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And I found that incredibly interesting because yeah. um, I also knew that that was going to going to be one of the hardest things when I myself moved back to the rural area. I didn't move back to the place where I came from. I lived. I moved to the North Sea shoreline, which is a, a different place. But that is actually the reason why I didn't do it. Move back to yeah. the place that I came from because uh, I knew that I would be so out of character and that I would not be able to play the daughter I was when I was young and lived there and it and wouldn't that, be the same mirror as when no, you it left. Wouldn't. and it would be painful I mean they would be looking at me and think that I was someone but I had of course changed and um <clears throat> and uh developed into something else yeah. so uh, that's also I think one of the reasons why people stay in the situation that they're probably not super happy about and they think oh, I could feel better I want to go home I want to live in a forest I want to have a you know a houseboat or something and they go oh but would I fit in will probably I find not. and friends? that's a human condition yeah I mean it's and it's not and the good thing about become getting older mm -hmm. is that um either you turn into a cocoon <laughs> or you embrace being an, a misfit. Yeah, I, I, I think so it's very liberating to do the latter. <laughs> yeah, exactly, it is. It's, a, it's, it's lonely, process. it can be lonely, but it's liberating. <laughs> well, I think Gaudi, that is a perfect place to end the interview, unless um, you, do you have anything you would like to add? Because I think this was, um, this is great. No, I think, uh, um, um, I don't think there is anything else but uh, for me to say, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, I am the one saying thank you. This was an absolute pleasure. I really, really enjoyed it. And um, to our viewers, I hope you found the discussion interesting and meaningful. Um, and this interview is, is part of a series where we are 
promoting Danish literature in English translation. And if you enjoyed it, uh, please watch the other interviews we have and also um, sign up for the literary uh, book club that we have um, hosted by Nita Smith. Um, before we end, I would like to take a moment and thank uh, the Scan Design Foundation, Museum of Danish America, Northwest Danish Association, National Foundation for Danish America, National Nordic Museum, American Scandinavian Foundation, University of Wisconsin, Madison, and the University of Washington Scandinavian Studies Department. Thank you so much for tuning in and see you next time.